When I was in third grade, I made a friend named Nicholas, Nicky for short. We were both on the quieter side compared to our classmates, and we both shared a love for pudding cups. One day at school, Nicky forgot his lunch at home, so I told him he could have my pudding cup. That's how we became friends. From that moment on, we shared my pudding cups every day. The other kids in our class used to tease us, accusing us of having crushes on each other, and chant that horrible, well, horrible to an eight-year-old at least, K-I-S-S-I-N-G song all the time. It had become customary for Nicky and I to separate ourselves from the other kids at recess and at lunch. We had a big tree we would always meet under. In the morning, at recess, and for a few minutes after school before our parents came to pick us up. Nicky lived with his older sister and single mother. He tried explaining the concept of divorce to me once, but in my eight-year-old mind it didn't make sense that his parents weren't together, happily married. As you can imagine, my parents were married, and my home life was the epitome of adoring nuclear family. Imagine Full House, except with a mother who hadn't passed away, and a couple of cousins instead of uncles. I can't recall a single moment in my childhood where I felt unloved or uncared for in any way. I soon realized that was a rarity. During one of mine and Nicky's morning visits to the tree, as we had cleverly named it, he invited me to his birthday party. He excitedly unzipped his backpack and withdrew an invitation card made of blue construction paper. There was a hand-drawn tree on the front, two little kids of approximately mine and Nicky's size and coloring, and a home address scribbled inside. To this day, I still have it. When the bell rang, he and I ran inside with the rest of the kids, and I waited all day for him to give out the rest of his invitations, but he never did. I was the only one he had invited. Because the other kids teased us so much, my eight-year-old mind had chalked it up to the conclusion that he didn't want any bullies there, and therefore had invited his only friend, me. Suffice to say, I was flattered and happy. I gave the card to my mother later on in the evening. She smiled and said, How cute, before very quickly giving me permission to go. It was my first non-family birthday party. The next day I went to the store with my mother and older brother, and we picked out a birthday present for Nicky. He and I were heavily into Transformers, so we got him a tiny Transformer, after getting permission from his mother, and I wrapped it up in blue wrapping paper all by myself. His birthday was on the following Saturday. My mother dropped me off in Nicky's house, briefly speaking with his mother in the kitchen, discussing pickup times and how fast they're growing up, before kissing me on the forehead goodbye. Because Nicky, his sister, and I were the only ones there, we decided to play a couple of board games and then tag when it wasn't raining anymore. We were in the backyard. It got to be a little sunny after, and Nicky and I fell deep into our dramatic reenactment of the latest and most exciting Power Rangers episode to date, that we had seen at least. His sister, a preteen at the time, went inside for a minute to check something, which Nicky later revealed to me was a code phrase she used when she wanted to talk to the cute neighborhood boy on the phone. Inside the kitchen, his mother was cooking and keeping an eye on us through the window. It was only as we went inside to eat that I realized there were no decorations. In fact, there wasn't anything to signify that it was Nikki's birthday at all, except for the homemade chocolate cake. I had loosely gathered that Nikki's family didn't have a lot of money, and that probably was the reason he went to school without lunch so often. But I never really asked, and Nikki never really said anything. Not that an eight-year-old would do either of those things. We went down to the basement after we cut the cake and took a couple of photos, where there was a tiny TV and a SNES. We played video games for roughly ten minutes before there was a loud knock on the door. Nikki stopped the game, Yoshi's Island, and jogged up the basement stairs to answer the door, eventually screaming, Dad, I thought you said you couldn't come. He was very excited, understandably so, considering how rarely he saw his father and what a big occasion it was in his life when he did. He would always tell me about it at school, that his cool, fun dad came to visit and took him for a ride around the block on his motorcycle. For a while, I'll admit I wasn't really sure if I believed his dad actually owned a motorcycle, but when Nicky came down to introduce me to his dad, I followed him outside to the front yard and saw a big, black Harley parked in the driveway. There were two helmets, one for his dad and one for him. I was instantly jealous. My own father drove a minivan and wore polo shirts and cargo pants almost religiously. 
Nicky's dad, however, was the complete and total opposite of mine. He wasn't suburban at all. In fact, he looked like a character out of The Outsiders. Right away I thought he was cool. And right away, I wanted to fit in with them. I should note that Nicky and I came from completely different ethnic backgrounds. He was white, I wasn't. Because I went to school with majority white kids and lived in a town with majority white population, I found it very difficult to fit in sometimes. That was part of the reason I had grown so close to Nicky so quickly. He was pretty much the only kid in school who gave me the time of day, and I him. The other kids didn't like me because I looked different, and they didn't like Nicky because he wore old faded clothes. He was raised on a modest salary. His mother had a few jobs, if I remember correctly. She was a waitress, a grocery store clerk, and a part-time janitor. For a single mother with two growing kids, a house and a car that was always break down, she was always quite optimistic. I liked her a lot. She was always nice. Even when she caught one of the bullies in school shoving Nikki to the ground once, she was nice. So when she wasn't nice to Nikki's father, and when she pulled him aside to ask him to leave, I couldn't help but wonder why. My mother picked me up soon after, and I made a pact with Nikki that I would come over again very soon. Because my mother had finally met his in person and spoke with her, I was allowed to come over and play now. Before that, she would always tell me, not until I meet his mother. From that point on, I went over to Nikki's house two or three times every week. Sometimes his mother would be there, sometimes his older sister would be there. One of them was always there to look after us and make sure we didn't get up to any trouble. We would usually just go down to his basement and play video games. Or, when the weather would allow it, we would ride bikes in the cul-de-sac and jump on his tiny trampoline. He was always better at flips than me, and I kind of resented him for it. One time he tried to teach me how to front flip, and I nearly landed on my head. The second I got to my feet, I ran away and started crying, mostly due to embarrassment. I wanted Nicky to think I could hang, but I really couldn't do any of the cool things he could. My own parents thought trampolines were too dangerous and forbade me from jumping on Nicky's. I used to do it anyway, though. Kids'll be kids. Nicky thought I was cool, though, and to get my crybaby butt to feel better, he admitted he was a little jealous of me. He said he was jealous of my new clothes, my new bike, and just about everything new that I had. That was the first time he opened up to me about being less privileged. The SNES in his basement was an old gift from a cousin of his who lived in the next town over, but it barely worked half the time. That was probably why his cousin gave it away. We sat in his basement for a few minutes talking about all the little reasons we were jealous of each other, and then his sister came down to say she was going to the mall with her friends, but that their dad was coming over to look after us. Their mother was at work that afternoon. For whatever reason, Nicky was shocked to hear that his dad was coming over. I took it as a surprise visit, and ran outside with Nicky when we heard the motorcycle. Indeed, his dad was there, and he also had a late birthday present for Nicky in his hands. It was a box, roughly the size of his head, and it was wrapped in newspaper. When we went inside to open it, he made Nicky promise not to tell his mother what he got him. Apparently, his mother didn't want Nicky to get a present from his dad, but his dad bought him a present anyway. Nicky readily nodded, so I followed his lead. I watched Nicky tear the newspaper to shreds, revealing a brand new Polaroid camera. Nicky had no idea what it was at first looking to his dad for answers before I excitedly said, A camera! You got a camera! I could tell Nicky felt embarrassed he didn't know right away, but he was just so happy he got something he brushed the embarrassment aside and we opened the box to play with it. His dad taught us how to use it and explained how it worked to us. He pointed it at Nicky and snapped the first photo, flapping it in the air after, and then showing us the final product. It was very cool to me that the photos came out right away. My family had a camera too but we had to wait for the photos to get developed at a store. By that time, I'd always forget and lose interest. But Nikki's new camera printed out photos right away. Nikki loved it, I loved it, and his dad really seemed to love it too. When his dad pointed the camera at me next, I smiled like a dork, and we all laughed at the photo after. My front teeth were missing, and I pretty much looked like I was high. Nikki and I traded our photos after. He kept the photo of me, and I kept the photo of him. We said we'd be friends as long as we kept the photos of each other intact, so I took extra good care of mine. Now that we had a new toy to play with, I was always asking to go over to Nicky's. 
Because I lived in a house with so many family members and relatives, I felt lost there sometimes. When I went to Nicky's, I felt more like I belonged, and it was always quieter there too. It was the mid-90s at this time, so parents were less strict with their young children, and mine allowed me to spend hours at Nicky's as long as his mother was okay with it. She always was. She loved having me around, because she knew how happy it made Nicky to have a friend to hang out with. My mother would frequently send me to Nicky's house with some sort of dish or snack, and she even invited Nicky's family to my house for dinner once. My family really liked his family, and I think my older sister had a tiny crush on his older sister, but she was always about neighborhood boys, so tough luck, bro. For some reason, I was allowed to go to Nicky's house almost every day now. He didn't live too far from my house either. We were within walking distance of each other, maybe about five blocks away. His house was one of the few places I knew how to get to, apart from my own. There were times when I would go straight to his house with him from school, and times when he would come over to play with me at mine. The latter happened rarely, as we both preferred his house. Mine was just way too crowded. One day at school, Nicky told me his dad had come over the other night and got mad at him for not taking any new photos of the Polaroid he got for his birthday. Both Nicky and I loved the Polaroid, and we thought it was very cool the first few times we played around with it. But as most kids do, we eventually lost interest in it, and Nicky sort of just tucked it under a blanket in the basement and forgot about it. I guess his dad didn't like that very much. So Nicky asked me if I'd help him take photos for the next time his dad comes to visit. In fact, he said his dad specifically requested that I be in the photos. I found this to be perfectly normal as an eight-year-old. I figured Nicky's dad wanted us to have fun with the camera and immortalize our friendship, make a scrapbook or something. Up until this point, Nicky's mother and sister still had no idea he even had a camera. I agreed I'd come over soon, and we'd take a bunch of silly photos. But Nicky forgot to mention one thing to me. He forgot to mention that his dad would be there. It was the same story as last time. His mother was working. His sister was at the mall with friends presumably with money their dad gave her, and their mother had no idea any of this was going on. I went over there after school, and I noticed the motorcycle parked out front. Nicky didn't seem surprised to see it, but something was off about his mood that day. I figured it was because he got in trouble the last time he saw his dad. Because it was raining a little, we went inside to hang out in the basement, where I thought we would play on the SNES for a bit. But that wasn't the plan at all. Nicky's dad was in the basement. He greeted me with a big smile and asked us how school was, if we did anything fun at recess, what kind of things we learned at class, the usual. I thought nothing of it, as my parents would always ask me similar questions. Eventually, Nicky's dad said we should start taking photos, so I obliged. I smiled widely for the camera, but instead of pressing the button and laughing at the photo like we had done the other day, Nicky's dad tutted at me and said I should try to look prettier. I had no idea what he meant by prettier, so I just smiled a little smaller and held it for a second, before he corrected me again. As you can imagine, he kept at it, nitpicking at me until I let my hair down, telling me to pinch my cheeks before every photo to make sure they were flushed, rosy, and... pretty. This whole time he hadn't taken a single photo of Nicky. Because it's been decades and because I've somehow managed to block most of this out. I'm not entirely sure what led up to it, but Nicky's dad eventually convinced me to start taking articles of clothing off. First my jacket, then my socks, and then my cardigan. And then, he asked Nicky to get in the frame. The whole time, Nicky had been standing off to the side not saying a word, and not looking at me either. It was like he felt something was wrong, but he was too afraid to say it. What ended up happening is exactly what you think. First, Nicky was told to hold my hands, then hug me, then put his face really close to mine, and then he was told to kiss me on the mouth. His dad snapped photos of it every step of the way, asking Nicky questions like, Isn't she pretty? Don't you think she's pretty, Nick? Do you want to take her out on dates? It was a whole lot of that and a whole lot of touching. The whole time I stood completely still. Not really sure of what was going on. Had any other boy been there with me, I'm not sure I would have remained so calm. Because it was Nicky, I felt somewhat safe. I didn't feel like we were doing anything wrong. 
The kiss was gross to me, but everything else I was mostly okay with. We stopped pretty quickly after the kiss. Not because his dad wanted to, but because I had to go home. My mother came to pick me up. Usually my brother would, so he could talk to Nikki's sister a little bit. But he had basketball practice that day, so my mother came instead. For some reason, Nikki's dad didn't go up to answer the door. He asked Nikki to do it, and I took a second to grab my jacket and sweater and put them on. During this time, while Nikki's dad and I were alone in the basement, he said he would come back to take more photos one day, and that I should wear makeup next time. I didn't have any at eight years old, but I didn't tell him that. I just collected my things and got out of there to go home. I saw my mother at the door, and she hugged me, asking how my day was. And suddenly, everything was normal again, for me anyway. I glanced back to wave bye to Nicky, but he'd already closed the door. The next day at school, he was completely ignoring me. I went to the tree and waited there all morning and all recess, and for an extra 15 minutes after school, but he wasn't there. I saw him in class, so I knew he was at school. He just didn't want to hang out with me for some reason. This carried on for the rest of the week, until one day, my mother got a phone call from Nikki's mother. I was in the living room watching wrestling with my brother, and I vividly remember my mother's smile vanishing as she listened on the phone to whatever Nikki's mother was saying. I remember asking what was wrong, if Nikki was sick, but my mother didn't say anything to me. She just nodded and listened and nodded and listened, face draining of color as though she had seen a ghost. Later, she asked to speak with me in my bedroom and asked me very clearly, Sweetie, who was there at Nikki's house the other day? Was it his sister Angela or someone else? As soon as I said someone else, her eyes became watery and she asked me what happened. I was vague on details, because I wasn't really sure what had happened myself. It was such a blur to me at the time. The only thing I worried about was Nicky, and why he had been ignoring me. Because I didn't want him to be more mad at me and ignore me for longer, I kept quiet about the camera, just saying that Nicky's dad watched us play and told me I was pretty. The last part was apparently enough to set off a huge red flag in my mother's mind. She gave me another hug, told me she wasn't mad at me, and that everything would be okay really soon. So, this is what happened. Apparently, Nikki's mother had found the camera, asked Angela about it, and then Nikki, quickly learning that their father had been coming over without her knowledge. The rule was that he could only visit when she was home, but the past few times she wasn't. The next day, I found Nikki under the tree at school and he very seriously told me that we couldn't be friends anymore. I asked why, and he just said, because. He went so far as to give me back the Polaroid of me smiling like a dork, and the one I exchanged for the Polaroid of him, both of them signifying our friendship. Because nothing really happened, because the world was a different place 20 years ago, and because the photos weren't explicit in nature, nothing happened to Nikki's dad. But that's not for the lack of trying on our mother's parts. I remember going to the police station, telling them everything with my mother there beside me, and repeating the story again to various lawyers. But the most we were able to accomplish was preventing Nikki's dad from seeing Nikki and Angela. Apparently, by coming to the house when Nikki's mother wasn't there, he had violated the terms of their custody agreement. When it was all over, the meetings and everything else, Nikki and his family ended up moving. Apparently, Nikki knew this was going to happen and that's why he told me we couldn't be friends anymore. I want to say that I managed to give him the photo back before he left and that we shared a pudding cup one last time, but I can't, because those things never happened. He moved, and I stayed, and for a really, really long time, I sat alone at the tree during recess. Eventually, I made new friends. Eventually, I stopped waiting for him to move back, and eventually, I was a happy kid again, but I have never... Not once in my life, forgotten about Nicky or what happened in his basement that day. The way everything about him changed so drastically. If it weren't for his dad, I'd like to think we would have remained friends, at least through childhood. The silver lining is that social media exists, and when I was 17, I found a friend request from a boy named Nicky in my notifications. Nicky's dead. Let's not meet. Ever. Ever. 
again.